Good morning. Okay, let's try that again. Ready? Good morning. How awesome is this space? So cool. And we're excited to have Carrie Bloomert speaking this morning. I've got a few thank yous. Uh, let's see here. Killer Coffee came through with coffee. Let's give him a hand. And breakfast is provided by Guernsey. If you like the donuts, let's let him hear your celebrated clap. The seating is provided by Roast Scout, which is actually me, so you're welcome. And for the theater, we're so privileged to be in the Yale Theater. This is just amazing. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to hand off the microphone to Audrey Falk. She manages the space, and she's going to read the manifesto and also tell us a little bit about the building. So we have to hand off two microphones, so give us just a second. Nobody move. Wow, this is so fancy. You get to do it again when you hand it off. When I do you want to come do this for me? There we go. There you go. All right. Good morning. <laughs> okay, so anybody who's been to Capitol Hill before, raise your hand. Oh, whoa, lots more than I thought. Anybody who has never been to Capitol Hill before? Anybody who's only been to Capitol Hill like one time? Okay. <laughs> uh, well, before I got involved here at the Yale, I had spent almost no time in Capitol Hill. Um, it's kind of this little gym that's been forgotten south of the river. Um, but if you guys drove across the river this morning, you'll see how close it is to the rest of downtown. Um, and is becoming ever closer with the, the new developments of Scissor Till Park and the Convention Center. Um, so just a little bit of history about the neighborhood. Um, I'm sure you guys have seen the state of decline that it has been in since the 1980s. Um, but it hasn't always been this way. Capitol Hill was actually originally uh, a proposed site for the Capitol Building. Um, this is kind of set up on a bluff looking over the river. So there was a whole group of people that right after the land run populated this neighborhood here hoping that the Capitol building, um, the site would be selected for the Capitol. Um, but when the railroad came in, north of the river made a little more sense and sort of the life of the city moved that direction. Um, but this remained a really bustling business district. If you guys look at the architecture down the street, um, you'll see most of the buildings were constructed in the early 1900s. Um, a lot of that architecture is still standing, even if it's sort of hidden beside, behind other facades. Um, but I'd encourage you this morning to just go walk around a little bit. It's a really, really cool neighborhood. Um, it's, uh, I believe, between 70 and 80 percent Hispanic. Um, so it's a really vibrant cultural center for the city. Um, and we are trying to capture that here at the Yale. Um, the original vision for the Yale was that it would return to being a community hub um, all the way from when the theater was built in 1910 up through the 1970s. This was a community theater. Um, you could come here to see a first run movie. Um, our, one of our owners, Amy Aptone, her dad grew up coming to the movies here with his family. Um, so it, it had a great cultural significance. Um, it was a safe place to come in this neighborhood. So we'd like to restore it as a community gathering space, make it really accessible for cultural events and community events here in this, in this, this part of the city. Um, but it's also a great venue. So we're hoping to bring in um, mainstream events as well and sort of bridge this side of the city with all of the other arts investment that is happening downtown. Um, we're hoping we can convince some bigger name bands to come in here and give the South Side a good show. Um, so, we're hoping you guys will explore the neighborhood a little bit. Um, if you guys have questions about the theater or booking, I'd love for you to come find me afterward. I'm going to have Steve Mason talk a little bit about the redevelopment. <laughs> well, this is Steve. Uh, Steve and his partner Amy own the Yale. Uh, this was a multi-million dollar project requiring extensive work with the Historical Preservation Society to make sure that the building remained historic. So do you want to share anything about that? Without remiking, <laughs> <clears throat> this is an example why tax credits are important. 
So to get a loan, you have to do an appraisal. In areas that are redeveloping, there's no comparable properties to support what you're spending. So all our comparable properties came across the river, across the highway. So by the time you take those comparable properties and bring them down here, they get discounted because to an appraiser, this is a lousy neighborhood, honestly. So our $2.8 million project appraised for $2 million. So you take the $2 million to the bank and you have a shortage of funds. And the tax credits fill the gap. So they do matter. Okay, guys. All right. Well, I'm going to read our manifesto real quick, and then we will get started. Everyone is creative. A creative life requires bravery and action, honesty and hard work. We are here to support you, celebrate with you, and encourage you to make the things that you love. We believe in the power of community. We believe in giving a damn. We believe in face-to-face -face connections, in learning from others, in hugs and high fives. We bring together people who are driven by passion and purpose, confident that they will inspire one another and inspire a change in the neighborhoods and cities around the world. Everyone is welcome. today I can see the sadness in every face that I am not Hetty Coleman and I just I can't fill those shoes I'm sorry um, thank you I mean, thanks for being honest Hannah I appreciate that um, Commissioner Bloomer so when uh, Mel said oh Commissioner Bloomer wants to speak and I was like yo I want to go with you to meet her so we went into the, uh, uh, the office and I couldn't tell you where it is now I could never find my way back without detailed instructions from the office but as we walked in you go down this elevator and it kind of gave me this ministry of magic feel because you kind of come out the elevator it's a long hallway and I was like this is already cool I don't know maybe don't think it was something to jump out but uh so Commissioner Bloomer we went in and she was just the most first of all her handshake is like amazing and I was like yes ma'am thank you ma'am appreciate your service um it was awesome I was like goals uh, I have so much respect for that handshake um but she's, she's really working hard. I love, I've been following her on uh, Facebook and just some of the live videos that she's doing, really working hard for maps for mental health and some justice reform, prison reform. Um, but I'm not gonna lie, when I went in the office, I, I got like a little bit of a Leslie Note vibe. <laughs> and I mean that in the best way. Carrie, like, props. I just, I have so much respect for that. Hey, I mean good with the commissioner. She had like this RBG like doll or bobblehead thing, and I was like, wow, okay, next level. The most beautiful couch you've ever seen in your life. And you're just gonna have to make an appointment to talk about community projects to go see it. Take my word for those gorgeous, beautiful velvet. But we are so honored to have someone from our own city community here to talk to us about a really important topic, justice, because it really does affect us all. So Commissioner Carrie Bloomer, everyone. High fives, hugs, come on up. Thank you. I'm going to put, I have all my liquids up here. Water, yes. coffee, okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, yes, giving me the compliment of being like Leslie Nope is the highest compliment anyone could give me. Um, good morning. My name is Carrie Bloomert. My pronouns are she, her, and hers, and I am one of your county commissioners. So thank you for coming. Um, and hello, everyone up in the balcony. Um, I dreamed last night that no one came. <laughs> so it really makes me happy that you're here. So, so my goal, let's see if I can do this. Thank you for the coffee, killer coffee. Okay, thank you for breakfast, Guernsey. And thank you for the seating roast scout and the Yale, of course. I hope my stuff is on here. There's my giant face. Okay, okay. So my goal today is to humanize the people involved in our justice system. They are just like you and me, and I'm sure that everyone in this room has engaged in some type of activity 
that could have gotten you thrown in jail, and we just happen to not get caught. So people in our jails today, people in our prisons, are just like you and me. And I think that is what we forget when we talk about all of these big numbers about our jails and our prisons, that they're just like you and me. So, well, before I do this, I'm going to read from um, a book called Poetic Justice. Are any of you familiar with the Poetic Justice program? Awesome. So Poetic Justice is a program here in Oklahoma started by a woman named Ellen Stackable. And she goes into jails and prisons and works with women and teaches them how to write and how to write poetry and stories. And it's one of the most incredible programs I've ever seen. And so I'm going to read a little summary about the program. And then throughout my talk today, I'm going to read a few of the poems that the women wrote who are in the program. So. There's also a documentary about poetic justice that I think was shown at uh, Dead Center, I think. So poetic justice began three years ago with a radical premise. Writing has the power to change lives, even the lives of those in prison. When the voiceless one finds her voice, she finds hope, and with hope comes the power to change. Paula Freire wrote in the Pedagogy of the Oppressed, human existence cannot be silent. To speak a true word is to transform the world. It is by speaking their word that people transform it and achieve significance as human beings. We invite you to step into these women's journeys as you read. One of my, and this is Ellen speaking, one of my favorite parts of every poetic justice class is when we sit down and we begin to write. Words become more than words as they are written, erased, and written again until they become life, truth, hope, and power to change. The room is always utterly silent except for the sound of pencils writing, and it is a sacred space. When it's time to share, the room is alive with laughter, tears, and even weeping. This is the space we are in every week, and it is both sacred and utterly safe. May these stories give you a glimpse into the human journey we experience every week. Okay, so a little background on what I do. And if any of you came to Pecha Kucha a couple weeks ago, I gave like a six minute speed talk of, of what I do. Um, but county commissioners serve both the executive and legislative duties for our county government. Um, this means that we enact local ordinances, um, we administer them, we approve budgets, we oversee spending, and we hire employees. And these responsibilities include funding and overseeing the operations of our um, Oklahoma County Sheriff's Department and our Oklahoma County Jail. So here is another poem from Poetic Justice. This was written by a woman who was inside the Tulsa County Jail, and she goes by S.M. This cage. There are many times I look up and stare at the moon from a cage that doesn't bring much joy. To see the moon through closed windows and locked doors fills my heart with such turmoil and dread. Yet I hope you are looking up to see that moon sparkle and splendor, thinking of better times we had. From this cage, I wonder what life has in store. Will we be lovers? or will we, will we be friends? Have you moved on to another forgetting the last four years? Will you believe in God as I do now or blame him for your misfortune? These are things I must wait to find out until I leave this cage and become free again to dance in the moonlight, unencumbered by walls. Either way, I'll understand because I found myself, my courage and my strength in this cage. So you hear the terms jails and prison a lot, and they are actually different. They mean, they signify different types of buildings. So a jail is a temporary holding facility. Most people in our county jail right now have not been convicted of a crime. They are awaiting their sentencing. 
They are awaiting to go to trial. They're awaiting for what a judge is going to say. They are waiting. It is run by local governments. Um, it's supervised by the county sheriff department. And it's designed to detain recently arrested people before their case is adjudicated. A person can also be held in jail for up to a year um, uh, for an extended period of time if their sentence for their offense is less than one year. Um, so if the judge sentences you to six months in jail, you would stay in jail, you would not be taken to um, a, a prison. Prisons, it is a state or a federal facility. So the county government does not have any say in what goes on in our prisons. Um, that's a state or a federal function. It's meant to house people who have been convicted of a crime. Um, to be in a state prison, a person must be convicted of breaking a state law, and to be in a federal prison, a person must be convicted of breaking a federal law. Um, and basic amenities in prison are typically more extensive than in jail because residents are more likely to spend um, more than a year of their lives in a prison. Come on. So one in 100 Oklahoma adults are in jail or prison at any given time. And you all have probably heard this a lot before. Oklahoma incarcerates more people per capita than anywhere else in the entire world. That is a pretty disgusting fact. It doesn't mean that we have worse people than anywhere else in the world. It means we just like to lock people up. So there are 27,000 people in state prisons, 13,000 people in our local jails, and 2,700 people in federal prisons in Oklahoma. Incarceration is 10 times more expensive than treatment than mental health and addiction treatment. It is 10 times more expensive. So we are literally wasting your tax dollars, sending people to prison, when oftentimes treating them for their disease could be a lot less expensive and a lot more effective. Oklahoma is ranked number one in the incarceration of women. And again, we don't have worse women than any other state. We, just the way our laws are designed, a lot of our sentencing laws, and a lot of the ways we um, especially go after women who are victims of abuse, um, that is where we have really messed up in Oklahoma. Um, we over-incarcerate people of color, and I know a lot of you in this room are very aware of this. Oklahoma incarceration rates by race and ethnicity per 1,000 1, people. So that pink line, we over-incarcerate black people, we over-incarcerate Hispanic people. It's, it's a, I look at this every day and I, sometimes I feel very motivated and very em empowered to, to work on this stuff and other days I feel really um, disheartened and it kind of goes back and forth day to day, but I feel like if I stick with it and show up to work every day, um, it, Hopefully we'll have more good days than bad where I feel more impassioned to work on these things. So our Oklahoma County Jail, I won't make you raise your hand if you've been here, um, or if you, I learned that when I would speak to groups, I would say, who's been to the county jail? Thinking like, who's taken a tour? And I didn't realize like, okay, there could be some people here who maybe spent some time there. Um, so our Oklahoma County Jail was built in 1991 with a temporary one cent sales tax. How many of you lived in Oklahoma City in 1991? Some of you might not have been born. <laughs> so the county commissioners at the time did not necessarily think long term and they did not put any measures in place for ongoing operation costs. So they took that one cent for a couple of years, they built the facility, and then that one cent went away. It was temporary. Their thought was, we can contract with DOC, we can contract with other entities to house their inmates, um, and we, that's how we will make our revenue. And the facility itself became so poorly run that all of those contractors pulled out and canceled their contracts. So now we have no revenue from those types of sources, um, to, enough to sustain running the entire facility. 
So it has 1,200 cells. Um, it has detained up to 2,800 residents at one time. And if you notice, I use the word, I'm trying to use the word resident and not inmate um, as more person first language. So we are trying to say resident. Um, again, there, most of them are, have not been convicted of their crime yet. So 2,800 residents was a couple years ago, um, probably 2016, 2017. And that is when I think the broader community in Oklahoma City really saw what a huge issue this was. Um, people were dying every month. Um, it was, uh, I think people finally realized this is, not, this is not working. So currently today, our average is around 1,600 residents. And that is the average of um, the late 90s. So we are, we are back to a more stable number. I would like to see us get down closer to 1,000 or 1,200, um, but we are, we are working on it. Um, three quarters of Oklahoma County Jail residents are arrested by the Oklahoma City Police Department. So our county jail is run by the county, um, but most of our residents who are brought there are brought by Oklahoma City Police. So we have to have a really good working relationship with Oklahoma City Police Department. Um, we are the only county in the entire state, so 77 counties were the only county that does not have a portion of its sales tax dedicated to some type of county government function. Most counties use that, that sales tax revenue to help fund the operations at their jail. Not all counties have a county jail. Um, so we are the only county in the whole state that doesn't have that regular revenue. So what we do is your property taxes, whether you pay rent or you pay a mortgage, your property taxes fund county government, and we take a huge chunk of that funding and fund the jail and our sheriff's department. Um, 25 to 40% of the people being held at our county jail are experiencing mental illness. So of the 1,600 people today, around 400 are on some type of mental health medication, some type of psychotropic medication. So that means that there are probably more than 400 people who have some type of mental illness and they are just not receiving treatment or they're, not, they're choosing not to receive treatment or they don't know that they have a mental illness. Um, so 400 of 1,600 today are receiving some type of treatment in our jail. And you all probably heard me say this before, but in our jail, um, they did not, when they built it in 1991, they did not put in any space for medical providers to do any sort of medical care. They thought that if someone needed medical care, we could put them in an ambulance, take them to OU, and they could receive treatment there, and then we would bring them back to the jail. And I don't think they, or maybe anyone in 1991, anticipated um, the, the explosion of addiction that we would have in our community um, and the lack of treatment in the community for mental health. And so what we have done now in 2019 is on the top floor of the jail, the 13th floor, they have um, taken the doors off of cells. They've kind of configured a medical space. And if you ever want to go through the jail and take a tour, we can take you up to the 13th floor and let you see what the medical providers are dealing with, um, the, the space wise. So we work with a company that uh, a medical provider, a medical company that Tulsa also works with, but our contract with them is way more expensive because the facility itself is so poorly designed. So your tax dollars are paying a higher contract for this company because of a poor design of a building. So we're still feeling the effects of a badly designed building from 1991. So in 2019, a lot of changes happened. Um, I came into county government. I don't look like I belong in county government. I don't look like my colleagues, um, which is kind of fun. Um, we got two new commissioners. Commissioner Kevin Calvi and I both came in with the jail as our big focus. Um, and both of us are public advocates for mental health and addiction treatment. And I really appreciate that both of us came in with that as our, our big um, focus. Um, the Sheriff's Department created a Citizens Advisory Board, 
which is super exciting. Um, Voice worked with the sheriff's office to get that going. And they've had two meetings so far. They picked nine community members who want to get very involved at the jail and very involved in the sheriff's office. And it's, uh, I'm really excited about that group. Um, the jail trust. How many of you have heard we have a jail trust now? A couple of you? Oh my gosh, a lot of you. Okay, so a lot of counties in Oklahoma um, create what's called a jail trust or a jail trust authority. And it simply is the commissioner's vote to create a separate body that helps them govern the jail, allocate the funding, oversee the operations. Um, because a jail is such a huge, complicated facility, it, um, it gives these nine people, um, it's a lot easier to manage a facility that large when you have a body of nine rather than three commissioners who have a lot of other responsibilities on their plate too. So um, led by Commissioner Calvi, he was the one that kind of came in and said, we are gonna do this. All three commissioners voted in favor of it, which I think was really important. Um, and they have started meeting this summer. And I think we have some really awesome people on there and they have very good intentions. And I think we're gonna see some really good changes because of, because of our jail trust. Um, the mental health pod. So in our jail, we have two um, administrators that report up to our sheriff. One of them is Captain Bradley, and he has a background in mental health treatment. And he is kind of creating a pilot pod um, in our jail where he is allowing residents who have mental illness um, to all be in the same pod. And there will be services going on most of the day. Um, the residents will get to be out of their cell almost all day, seeing therapists, going to Celebrate Recovery, going to AA, um, really giving them all the services they need. And I hope that this becomes something we do on every floor of our jail, um, and then it just becomes, this is the norm of how we operate this facility. So really, really good leadership by Captain Bradley. Um, we're also doing the same with a veterans pod. Um, and then two, I think a week or two ago, um, I was able to present to Oklahoma City Council to ask them to use MAPS money to pay for more mental health and addiction treatment facilities, which we are hoping will have a huge impact on our jail and not send as many people to our jail who really just need treatment. So lots of really, really exciting changes. Thanks. So what does a future jail need? Um, one level. So if you think about a 13 story jail and you're taking literally thousands of inmates up and down an elevator, um, first of all, we have three elevators and they break all the time. <laughs> so when you, if you see any jail facility that's been built in the last 10 years, they're one level. It just makes it so much more efficient. Adequate medical and mental health care facilities. Tulsa County Jail has an entirely separate pod um, for people who are needing a higher level of mental health care. Um, that is what I would love to see in our future facility. Outdoor space and natural lighting. It is incredible what natural lighting can do for a person. Our jail currently has almost no natural lighting, almost none. And if you're a person struggling with depression, um, anxiety, no natural light can really exacerbate that, let alone being um, in a jail cell. So our jail right now has one ball court up on the 13th floor. And again, it's very hard to transport residents up and down those floors to try to get them time outside on that ball court. So we save that space for um, some of our, our juveniles who are in the jail, um, and I'll get into that in a minute. Um, some of our pregnant residents who we, in my opinion, should not be there in the, in the first place. We should take them back to the community, but that's a whole nother talk that I could give. Um, adequate space for classes and programs. Again, we don't have really good space for these types of things. Um, adequate space for in-person visitation. Currently at our jail, if you try to go down there and visit a friend or a family member who is waiting in our jail, waiting for trial, you cannot physically see them in person. 
you can see them on a video monitor and you can pay an exorbitant amount, unfortunately, to see them in person, or I'm sorry, to see them via video. And I didn't know this when I became a commissioner. And a woman contacted me and she said, I have friends in the jail, I tried to come see them and he, I, couldn't, I couldn't go see them. And that to me is a no brainer. Um, in order for us to uh, help people when they get out of jail, um, live productive lives and get the help they need, they need to have physical face-to-face -face contact with their fr friends and family. So, and that is a, that's a design fail of the building. There's not good space for it. Um, it. It is a policy decision by our sheriff's department, but it's also a design fail of the building that there's just not adequate space for that. And a therapeutic environment. Um, Anna Langthorne, who works with me, she and I toured the YWCA, their beautiful new apartments a couple weeks ago. And we walked out and said, why can't our jail look like this? It was warm, it was inviting, each person had their own room. Um, so that started uh, Anna and I thinking about, if we're gonna dream big, what could a new facility look like? and still be a secure facility that follows guidelines, national guidelines of how you build a detention facility. So we're trying to dream big. So why should you care and why should you get involved in anything related to criminal justice reform? Sometimes we forget that the people we incarcerate are just that, <coughs> they're people. They are our friends, our neighbors, and our family members. And when we lock them up, we take away their ability to contribute to the world. And if you think back to your manifesto that um, she read at the beginning, every person is creative and every person has the ability to contribute to the world. The damage we cause goes far beyond one individual's life. Children lose their parents, employers lose their workers, and our community loses trust. So what can you do? Use person-centered language. Speak up when you hear incorrect language about people who are incarcerated. It's a very easy to use us versus them language. They are incarcerated, they messed up, they did something wrong. It's very easy to talk that way. So I'm trying to train myself not to use that type of language. Um, you can take a tour of the jail and ask lots of questions. Um, you can contact your elected officials, city, county, school board, state, federal. Um, in the last eight months that I've been in this job, I've been pleasantly surprised at how many people have found my information and contacted me about an experience they had in our jail or a family member who's currently in the jail and every single time someone contacts me, I learn something new. Um, and I, I think that is the most important part of being an elected official, is having your constituents contact you because it helps me as much as it helps you. Because then I can turn around and connect you with the help and resources that you need, and it educates me on what, on what we're doing that I might not have known we were doing. Um, you can donate or volunteer to organizations like TEAM, the Recovery Center, the Homeless Alliance, Women's First Step, and I think we have Terry here from Remerge. Ooh. Terry. Um, Remerge, I can't believe I didn't put Remerge up here. Remerge is an incredible program that helps women who are pregnant or have minor children um, who would have otherwise been sentenced to time in prison. They, if they're accepted into the Remerge program, they do not go to prison they get housing, they go to all kinds of amazing classes and, and they have an incredible support system. They move through different levels um, to get to spend more time with their children. Um, they come out of the program with a job and they come out of the program with their, their uh, whatever they were charged with completely erased. And it is an incredible program. So Terry, raise your hand one more time. If you wanna learn about Remerge, go talk to Terry. <laughs> Um, you can volunteer on a campaign. You can volunteer on my campaign if you want. 
Um, you can apply for local boards and commissions at the city and county level. Um, city, council, city councilors and county commissioners, we have a lot of local boards and commissions that we get to appoint people to. And if you contact me and say, I'm really interested in these five issues, then I know in the future when a spot comes open, we can talk about appointing you. Um, attend public meetings, or you can follow OKC SPAN. Marty, raise your hand. <laughs> Marty has been attending um, public meetings around Oklahoma City and live tweeting them. And I think you're educating a lot of people on what's going on in local government. So it's pretty awesome. You can run for office. Um, vote. Uh, legislative session is February through May 2020. There are a lot of legislators who really care about criminal justice reform and are probably going to run bills related to um, bail reform and um, sentencing laws. So if you do not know who your state legislator is or your state senator, you should go look that up after this. Um, Destigmatize mental illness and addiction treatment. Talk about it like any other health issue. Be honest with your own mental health and or addiction needs. Um, something that uh, Anna Langthorne and I try to do and something that Councilwoman Jo Beth Hammond tries to do is I see a therapist every month and I try to talk about it like any other regular doctor appointment to normalize this is part of my health. I'm seeing a doctor for my brain and for my, my health, my mental health. So try to talk about your personal mental health in a way just like you would talk about any other health issue. And then use your personal social media to educate and advocate. Uh-oh. So the last poem I'm going to read, I think this was written by a woman at Mabel Bassett Women's Correctional Center, which is our largest women's prison in Oklahoma. I am an inmate. I am an inmate. My name is Offender. The number in the thousands of women incarcerated in our state. A number that continues to explode exponentially after all, they can always add more bunks, can't they? I am an inmate. My name is useless and addict. My number is seven, the mandatory minimum amount of years due to me for my drug crime. But why not make it an even 10 for my first offense? I am an inmate. My name is broken, abused, forgotten. My number is eight the age of my oldest son when I was locked away. What is motherhood again? I am an inmate. My name is violent, thief, abuser, monster. My number is seven. The number of years since prison reform was mentioned in Congress. And what has changed? Nothing. I am an inmate. My name is sister daughter, mother. My number is one. The number of times I've been denied parole. What were the grounds? No one knows. I'm an inmate. My name is neighbor. My number is two. The number of years I have left in this place. And what will you call me then? I am an inmate. My name is Angelina. My number is 67812, the number of a single mistake and the one I must wear for life. So we can fix this mess if everyone plays their part and takes some type of action. And that's going to look different for every single person here. The people in our jails and our prisons are just that, they're people. And thank you for listening today and for playing your part. Oh, I didn't even drink any of my stuff. Thank you, Commissioner Bloomer. Do you want to answer some questions? Sure, sure. I feel like we're going to have I a few. Can... We don't have a ton of time because, you know, your chairs have to be gone away from here soon. But um, we, we have time for one or two. Yes, ma'am. I'm going to come to you so we can get you on the, 
audio. One thing she didn't say was I read in the newspaper uh, when you go to court and uh, the judges get money based on how much people they convict. And that needs to be changed. And my name is Jane Neely. Thank I live you, in Jane. Park. All right, I'm going to squeeze by you, Miss Jane. Pardon me. Hello, my name is Marsha Heron. I'm with Oklahoma City Public Schools. So I have a question for you that I kind of wrote down. Um, first, I want to thank you for the talk. And I'm a special educator, and I have valued person first language since the inception, inception of the law. So thank you for making that more public. Um, we are talking about and looking at the dream of a new jail, but my question is more related to the actions that take place prior to detention. Will there be any supports put in place to evaluate individuals based on a tiered crime system to provide well-rounded evaluations for crimes that are not deemed violent, such as those related to mental health or addiction, petty theft, or other nonviolent offenses to keep them from staying in jail in the first place? That's the first part. And then the second, the jail is treated in some ways like a hotel because individuals are charged for their stay and those who are unable to pay incur other issues in this vicious cycle. Can you talk a little bit about what is being done to be proactive regarding arrested individuals? Thank you. I'm going to try to answer both of them. So the answer to your second question, what your first question was about um, assessing a person for their needs based on their crime. And then your second question was, like I had a good answer. Yes, I'm very glad you brought that up. So do you ever hear of a rich person sitting in jail? No. Almost everyone in our jail is there because they um, cannot afford bail to get themselves out. So when you're booked into jail um, and you come before a judge, the judge sets your, your bail amount or, or bond is, is a term we use too, um, to decide how much you have to pay to get yourself out of jail. Um, and there's lots of court cases that deem this pra practice unconstitutional, um, but we, we are literally locking up people because they don't have money. Um, I would, uh, Nicole McAfee is here with ACLU, and she worked extremely hard on cash bail reform, and I, I think there's some effort to work on it next year as well. Okay. <laughs> um, so I would love to see, and I am very committed to working on cash bail reform as well, um, to prevent us from locking up people just because they don't have the money. Um, and I, this is all with the understanding that there are some people who um, are a, a danger and a threat to our community, and they need to be in a safe, secure space. Um, but there are a lot of people who just cannot afford to get themselves out. So, and then the answer to your first question, we currently um, utilize North Care. Um, is anyone here who works at North Care? Okay. Um, we do offender screenings, which I hate that term, but that's what we call it. And it is an assessment of how high is your need for services or your need for some type of case management, and how high is your likelihood to reoffend um, if we let you out today. Now, we are also working with the Department of Mental Health to potentially use a different type of screening called ORAS, um, Ohio Risk Assessment. And that has been proven to be a lot more effective in determining um, who, who needs to, to get out on maybe a pretrial release program or an OR bond. Um, so we're, we're working on improving that screening process. Um, and North Care and then I, a team does pretrial release as well. Um, and I think both of them are working to try to get more people out um, than previously. I saw some numbers yesterday when we were at our um, advisory council meeting that um, North Care was getting out was it 70 people a month on, on just on North Care's program? Team gets out several, a lot of people too. And then we have programs at the county um, where we get people out on OR bonds and conditional bonds. And an OR bond stands for own recognizance. And it basically means that we have done an assessment on you and we feel like you can leave jail on your own word that you'll come back to court on a certain date. 
um, a conditional OR bond is there's a little more parameters around us letting you out. You might have to come and do um, a UA test, stands for urine analysis. You might have to come in and do drug testing um, and have a little more supervision, but we're still letting you go back home. Um, so I am working with my staff to try to figure out ways to increase the number of OR bonds, conditional bonds, and increase the people getting out through North Care and team. Sure, just really briefly. Uh, uh, Councilman Stonecipher and uh, Councilwoman Nice and Councilperson Hammond uh, had, as the Judiciary Committee with the City Council, uh, working closely with the Municipal Court, that's not the County Court, but they uh, launched an, uh, an amnesty program basically for unpaid tickets. So if you work with somebody or you know somebody or you personally have an unpaid ticket and you've got a warrant because you haven't been able to pay that ticket, you won't get arrested. Go to uh, go to the municipal court. Contact them. It's a limited time program, but so far uh, they're mitigating those fines. Uh, again, this is for the city. This is not the county. The county court system is a totally different animal. But the city court uh, are mitigating those fines and. Uh, so far have collected, people have been responding to it, and it's only been a month or so, and they've collected $30,000 in fines uh, from mitigating these fines and erasing those warrants. So I want, the city has really moved away from trying to jail people for tickets and for unpaid jail stays, which is asinine that we have that, but they won't arrest somebody for not having paid their jail stay anymore. Uh, the city won't. Uh, can't say much for the county, but. <laughs> And then our third commissioner, um, one of, Commissioner Brian Wan, one of his staff members is here. Could you raise your hand? Hi. Say your name for everyone. Aaron Moore. Thank you. Last question? Yeah. I was at your MAPS 4 presentation. All the snaps were carried for the MAPS 4 mental health presentation. That was amazing. Um, if your RTC gets funded through MAPS 4, is there a plan to demolish the current county jail and potentially move it and or create a facility? Like, if your RTC gets funded, obviously the need for the county jail is going to diminish dramatic, dr dramatically, right? Yeah. So is there a plan to, if you can get the RTC funded, demolish the current county jail since it's such a... Sh <laughs> uh, uh, problem. <laughs> uh, the link is... Is that a plan? And then maybe rebuild a county jail that makes a lot more sense. Uh, tell me what your plan is for that. So I am one of three commissioners and I am not a trustee on the jail trust. I have an appointee on our jail trust. It's a woman named Francie Ekwerekwu, who is a public defender with team. Um, so she is kind of my proxy on, on the trust. So because we created the jail trust, when we build a new jail facility, that whole process will be organized and run by the trust. Now, if we put anything on the ballot, say we put a quarter cent sales tax, a half cent sales tax, whatever, that will be the call of the commissioners. Um, so it's, it, both of us have play a part in, in getting a new facility. I want a new jail facility. I can't speak for the members of the trust. I can't speak for the other two commissioners. Um, I would love to demolish our current jail. Um, I know that there are people who are interested in gutting it and completely redoing it and utilizing the bones of the building. Um, I don't know if that's worth our money and worth our time. Um, someone the other day mentioned to me potentially making it into apartments and I don't know if I would want to <laughs> live in that space. I mean more power too if you do I guess. We'd have to come in and like sage that place, but. Would it, would it make like a dramatically like different need for the county jail if your RTC? Yes, like yes. RTC so part of my, part of the mass proposal was a what we're calling a restoration center, and it is a full service mental health and addiction treatment facility. Police can bring people there. You can walk in off the street. Um, it will have med safe medical detox. It will have detox services for people who are using meth. Um, mental health crisis beds, a pharmacy, a mobile outreach team that will go out into the community with licensed mental health providers. Um, it will, I mean, I see this as like this incredible souped up, like 
mental health and addiction treatment facility. So our hope is that that will mitigate a lot of the people that are being taken to our jail right now or being taken to the emergency room. Um, so yes, I would hope that our jail doesn't need to be, our next jail doesn't need to be as big, but that is reliant upon a lot of different puzzle pieces. Our judicial system, our DA, our public defenders, um, our sheriff's department, our trust. So it's all these puzzle pieces that have to come to an agreement that we need a new facility, what it's gonna look like and how big it's gonna be um, and what type of, of treatment space and mental health treatment space we're gonna have in it. Um, so did that answer your question? Okay. We are out of time, guys. Sorry, sorry. everyone. I'm sorry, I hate to be the person, but thank you so much you. for taking the time to educate us and invest. And let's do this. I didn't ask permission, so I'm going to ask forgiveness. Um, our friend from Team City Care, if you guys want to come up here at the end, and if you guys want to volunteer, they're happy to help. I'm sure that they need volunteers. If you want more information about our programs, um, if you're working with another similar program, please come up here, hang out, and you guys, we wanna enable you to like make those connections today at the end of our time together. Um, and what's great about things like this, like important topics, a lot of our, Mel and I were talking, a lot of our time together is fun and it's lighthearted, but this is important and this is Oklahoma, and this is our responsibility, every one of us that's here, and you're part of a worldwide organization. You can see there's 205 chapters, 65 countries, 20,000 attendees per month, 7,100 talks online with 8.3 million views. This is out there. This is out in the world and today will be presented to the world to let people know that this is important to us and the topic of justice and um, reform is important here in Oklahoma. And I'm really, really glad to have all of you here and just to show your support, not only for Commissioner Bloomer, but for an important topic like this. Not, not necessarily anything that you are like, yay, I feel so excited when you leave, but you're empowered to kind of make better decisions so you can be a part of the solution. Um, and again, thank you to our local sponsors, Clover, the Treasury, and Rose Scout for making this everyday thing happen. Um, and again, our volunteers, this is all volunteer led. We don't make money, we don't take money. So this is all volunteers. Please high five these guys on your way out. Um, they're running all over town, getting the donuts, coordinating chairs, planning the day, doing social media. The work doesn't stop when we leave here. This is a everyday thing that we, we work hard to make it excellent for you guys. So high five your volunteers. And of course our video guy and his bicep. I will never let him live that down. That's like the most awesome headshot I've ever seen. No one can top that. If you can top that, I dare you to try. And Christian here with our photos every single month. And T. Slimp up in the soundboard just turning the microphone on. Thanks for that, bro. We appreciate you being here. And again, uh, if you took any photos today, hashtag CM Justice. Thank you so much for being a part of this important day. Please connect with Commissioner Bloomert and your representatives online, and we encourage you to go out and make a difference. Have a great Friday, guys.